So hopefully, uh, hopefully things will be um, all smooth, but uh, hopefully my internet connection is good and my PowerPoint doesn't crash and uh, people <laughs> no are worries. engaged and we get a lot of yeah. questions. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Professor Keel. How are you, Sarah? Uh, hello, hello, Sarah. Um, Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for thanks for being part of this organize this very important organization. Well, Thank we you. are very, very pleased that I mean you're joining us, Paul. Yeah, indeed. Um, so you started recording, uh, Edward, right? No, as do you want to record it on on your on your uh, on your computer then, Sarah? I did, uh, but right now it's recording. So who who, who initiated it? Yeah, I don't know. I think you can record starting in a minute. So I'm no, it's already recording. <clears throat> no, no, it is recording right now. But who started it? I have no idea. Maybe Farhana did it such that once we so, so, such that it's automatic and then it yes. records to the cloud. Could be. Could be, yes. Maybe we yes. shouldn't talk to it. Since it worked last time, maybe we should leave it alone. Exactly. Okay. Okay, it's nine o'clock. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Depends where you are in the world. And I'm extremely pleased to introduce our fifth uh, webinar uh, on behalf of MPWB. Uh, we started our webinars uh, when COVID broke up. And uh, this year, I mean, we have been doing webinars on more technical issues. Uh, our moderator today is uh, Sarah Ashmeg, and uh, she has been moderator for the last several uh, webinars. Uh, unfortunately, Arjit Bargawa has uh, had very emergent commitments that he couldn't join us at this time. He perhaps may be able to do that later on. And uh, so Edward uh, Gershkevich, uh, who is with us, is going to take your questions, monitor your uh, comments and uh, questions. And so with that said, uh, Sarah, please take Sorry. over. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Um, welcome, everyone, to our um, fifth webinar today with the Medical Physics for World Benefits. Today's topic is very interesting. It's about cost-effective, globally deployable radiation therapy, the same but smarter and radically different, presented to us today by Professor Paul Keel from Australia. As uh, Jacob was saying, unfortunately, RJ won't be joining us today, but Edward is uh, kindly here today and will be helping with your questions and uh, with moderating the session. Uh, the presentation itself will take around 45 minutes, and then we'll give 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, and then the last five minutes will be for final comments and uh, thanks. We will be sending out uh, multiple choice questions. Uh, so please um, answer them. Uh, they will be in Google document format. And then once they're all answered, um, we'll send you out certificates. I think we've had some technical issues for those uh, who have attended our last seminars. The certificates are not sent out yet, but uh, they, will be, um, they will be sent to you shortly, hopefully. Uh, the webinar is recorded. Um, then we will post it online. It's typically on YouTube on the MP. Um, WB website or channel rather, and uh, you can share it with the community. Our speaker today, uh, Professor Keel, is a professor at the University of Sydney and director of the Image X Institute. Uh, his main interests involve image guided radiotherapy and accounting for anatomic and physiological changes in healthy and pathologic conditions through a uh, radiation treatment course. Um, these research activities have resulted in over 350 scientific articles <laughs> and several awards and honors. Very impressive. He has developed new methods of, uh, for medical imaging and image body radiotherapy. Several of these innovations have been translated to clinical practice for improved healthcare. We, were, we are really honored and happy to have you with us, uh, Professor Keel, today. Um, 
to the audience, please write your questions in the chat uh, section, and they will be brought forward to the speaker uh, by the moderators to be answered uh, at the, during the question and answer session. So please, in the chat section. And uh, that's it. Without further ado, I would like to pass the microphone uh, over to Professor Keel, and I, I'm really uh, excited about today's uh, session. Welcome. Uh, great. Um, th thank you very much, Sarah. And it's a pleasure to give a, a presentation to uh, to this group. Not been a supporter of uh, medical physics world benefit uh, since the since the start, and uh, I know many of the people and who have you know put a lot of time into this organisation. So it's uh, an honour to be able to give a little bit back, and hopefully you'll find this um, of of interest. Um, and just a, a minor point, we all live in COVID times um, uh, from home, so let me know if the connection, uh, I can change the connection slightly if, uh, if I do start to break up, so just please, please let me know if I'm talking and I'll see if you freeze. So I'm, um, I'll be talking about uh, translating technology to improve healthcare and also some of the, and with a focus on some technologies that can be, that are sort of more more scalable and don't involve necessarily additional additional cost. Just ways of doing things, um, it may be a bit a bit smarter, and really using mathematics and physics to improve the current processes for cancer radiation therapy. And I will be, uh, and then if I, the title does say radically different, so I thought I'd throw in something as well. So let me just share my. Uh, I do have uh, a number of disclosures to, to make, and this is a, um, so these, these are shown. And in some ways for, uh, for what my job is, that engagement with industry is, is an essential part. If we want to take the ideas that, that we have um, more than just sort of from journal papers, but to have a real world impact, then that pathway is through, uh, is, is typically through industry. So why are we interested in improving technology? And if we start at a very high level, then cancer, the, the survival from cancer is improving with time. And this is some data specific to my country from Australia. And just the, the, the changing concept of from 1930 of cancer, you know, being that, being that death sentence nearly hundred years ago, 50 years later, half of the patients were surviving in five years, and currently 70% of patients are surviving in five years. And this is, radiation therapy is one part of this whole enterprise that, that, that we have these healthcare systems to detect and manage cancer. But it just is really pleasing to see that we, we are getting better. All of the technologies combined, whether they're um, diagnosis, prevention, whether they're uh, detection or treatment, are improving the management of this disease, which is a massive global healthcare burden. Now, cancer is, is a worldwide problem. And what we're seeing as uh, in developed countries, the growth in cancer is, tends to be with population growth in less developed countries because of the uh, improvements in non-communicable and communicable disease management, then the, the growth in less developed countries is increasing faster than, uh, faster than population. And already the number of case, um, cancer is a larger problem in less developed countries than it is in more developed countries globally. Of those patients, uh, how many need um, radiation therapy and looking at all of the all of the cancer sites and the benefit of radiotherapy then uh, this this number of one in two patients or the most recent is 48 percent of patients receive benefit from radiotherapy and if there there are um, an estimated 17 million new cases each year and with 
And so that's eight and a half million patients per year who would benefit from radiotherapy. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is that not all places have radiotherapy. Just to, to delve a little bit more into the, the benefit of, of radiation therapy, I'll just keep an eye on the chat. Yeah. Uh, 20, there's 23% five-year local control benefit um, for all radiotherapy patients. And that's, I think that's just a really um, demonstrating the value of, of radiation therapy and looking at both the local control um, and survival based on all of the different, um, breaking this down over all of the treatment sites. 6% um, five-year survival benefit and at a cost of $13,000 per life year saved, meaning this is incredibly cost effective as well compared to other many other therapies. So it's good to keep this in mind as a, if we're looking at um, global solutions, that radiation therapy is incredibly cost effective. Um, this is one of the uh, more commonly shown um, slides on the, on the left and just looking at the number of people served by each radiotherapy centre um, by, by country. Uh, there are still many countries in the world without access to radiation therapy uh, services. And where there is a, uh, where there's a lack of access to radiation therapy, then that, that correlates. There's, there's a high population as well. So what we're seeing is that uh, with most of the population um, living in low and middle income countries, and they have le less than half of the radiotherapy facilities. So there is, there's a big, a big gap to fill. And it was really pleasing to see the issue of the Lancet Oncology focused on, on radiation therapy. I think as, as, as scientists, particularly in um, essentially in medical physics, radiation therapy being sort of applied science, uh, sciences that to, to see the radiation therapy get featured as an entire issue and looking at global radiotherapy. Just one of, one of the many useful findings from this, uh, from this study that Investment in radiotherapy not only enables treatment of a large number of cancer cases to save lives, it brings positive economic benefits because we're getting people back, because we're enabling people to get back to work more quickly, reducing costs of care, um, of, of alternate care. Um, so there's, it's often we're talking about like global, globally, deployable technology, then it comes down to costs and you can demonstrate that there's actually value to this technology, then it's more likely to get adopted. Uh, there is a global shortfall of 10,000 um, radio, cancer radiotherapy machines. And from the IEA, then that's a lot of that is because of the cost of the machines. So one of the things I'll talk about today is a, a radically different uh, machine. And a lot of what the work that um, my team and I have been doing for, uh, for focusing a lot of our research efforts on is really looking at the changes in human anatomy and physiology that are occurring while a patient is being treated and over the entire, over the entire treatment course. And the, these changes in anatomy and physiology are these have been known. Um, I think what, what is changing is our ability to be able to detect and compensate for, for these changes. So just to, to give, and I'll just give some examples of some drivers where, where technology has improved clinical outcomes. And for those medical physicists, engineers, radiation oncologists looking at improving technology, then you really want to have, we don't just want to make technology better for technology's sake. We want to be sure that that improvement in technology will result in an improvement in patient outcomes. So the, 
a, a recent paper looking at um, 4DCT, a technology that I had been uh, involved with for uh, a number a number of years, is they looked at the pa patients where there were four, there were artifacts in 4DCT, and with and without looking at the um, local control for patients without artifacts, 40CT artifacts, and with 40CT errors. And you think that would, would just these changes, errors in an imaging modality actually result in a clinical change? And interestingly, they found that the local control dropped from 90% uh, to 70% for the patients where there were imaging errors. So there's a, there's a clear uh, demonstration there of the link between technology and outcomes. Uh, similarly, the, if we look at the difference between what, what difference did um, IMRT make, there have been a few um, prospective trials for IMRT. This one was, was retrospective. Looking at the, um, the toxicity in uh, the, the toxicity for the um, IMRT arm was eight was um, eight percent and thirty two percent in the non IMRT arm for this uh, for this cohort of patients, just demonstrating the, the clinical value of the improved technology. Uh, a a similar uh, paper from the same institution. This is um, MD Anderson with four hundred ninety six patients. This was a retrospective. Uh, retrospective trial and retrospective study and retrospective studies should be taken into context. But they found that for when they combined 40CT and IMRT, essentially modern technology, finding that the overall survival, um, there was a 65% in overall survival when they're combining um, modern technology. And also there was a 72% reduction in toxicity as well. So again, just linking, linking technology improvements to patient benefit. Uh, this study looks at the, um, the frequency of imaging and the frequency of image guidance. And uh, I think this is an excellent like, study that was done comparing weekly versus daily um, image guided radiation therapy or IGRT. And it's very difficult to, to get these studies um, off the ground and really applaud, applaud the, uh, the, the, French, the French cooperative group for making this, this happen. So they randomized 470 patients between daily and weekly image guided radiotherapy. The day response from the daily group is in, in black. Uh, the weekly group is in red. So we've got time and on the plot on the left, biochemical recurrence. Um, finding that there was a lower, um, significantly lower biochemical recurrence in the daily image guided group. And similarly, looking at the, uh, the rectal control, uh, the rectal toxicity, and that there was a significantly um, lower rectal toxicity as well. So seeing both an improvement in local control, at least by biochemical free uh, progression and toxicity, just using, using technology and deploying image guided technology. So the conclusion that more frequent imaging improves outcomes going from daily to weekly. And then if we take that the next, the next step further, there has not been a study of daily versus um, of real time versus daily and trying to really keep increasing the frequency of that imaging. But we, we do postulate that we would see at least improvements, we're not sure of the magnitude of improvements when we compare, if we did compare real time to daily image guidance. And that's a study that I would uh, love to be part of. Uh, and, and so for this, uh, in this study, this was a, a clinical trial that, um, that I was part of. And when we were looking at implementing real time um, targeting with, uh, with real time, targeting then the the dose that we delivered to the patient in this case um, there was quite a large anterior shift during treatment 
uh, that had we not uh, had we not been watching the position during treatment, we would not have been able to detect that there was a shift. And um, had we not yet been observing the patient, then there would have been a higher dose to the rectum, and part of the prostate uh, would have been would have been missed. So again, this is just using technology in a in a smarter way. Um, so who just um, our um, our research group is shown uh, is shown here. Large number of um, young, enthusiastic, smart people uh, from different and a few different backgrounds of um, biomedical um, mathematicians, biomedical engineers, um, some design, clinical trials, and of course um, medical physicists. And we've been um, fortunate enough to be involved in a number of um, clinical trials of technology that we have uh, developed and taken that technology to, uh, to, to the clinic. Um, fortunately, one of the uh, early implementations of um, single slice helical 40 CT, uh, looking at um, breathing training, uh, some real time targeting, uh, beam adaptation, and also um, ventilation imaging. And all, all of these innovations have been mathematics, uh, mathematics and or physics concepts and that, that haven't, haven't required additional expensive technology, really just, just leveraging tools that we already have and using that information in different ways. So as, a, as an academic group, we often focus on that, that discovery phase, the focusing on the, the, the new idea, um, developing that idea, maybe taking that to experiments. And I think one thing that we, we try to focus on is when we do have these, these good ideas with the technology, really trying to take them through to clinical trials and test them in the clinic and, hope and, and find what the, what the value is, but also what the further problems are to drive additional research. And of course, this, this talk is about global deployment. And one of the challenges is you go from a successful clinical trial, then how do you make something go into, into clinical practice? So our sort of project um, portfolio looks um, something uh, like this, where we've got a number of different uh, technology streams of sort of spanning the technology and thinking about uh, the title of this talk is about cost effective um, global innovation and probably the one the one outlier here that it wouldn't would not fit in that cost effective um, box in, in in some aspects that you could actually argue that um, that overall in the, in the whole scope of cancer care MRI Linux are cost effective but probably most of the portfolio that we work on, and that the research projects are focused on making using existing tools and that we have for cancer imaging and targeted radiotherapy and using them in smarter ways. So I'll just briefly go through uh, some of those and uh, for example, real-time cancer targeting. And the innovation here is, is just to use existing equipment and we're just imaging, gonna image during treatment and solve, solve the 2D to the, to the six degree of freedom problem. And what this means is that during treatment, we, are, we can acquire X-rays, <coughs> excuse me, we are acquiring X-rays and using that, using those X-rays plus prior information to find out where the tumor is in 3D and also the rotational pose of the target as well. There was a, um, a review in uh, the Red, Red Journal and I'm asking the question, are we at the tipping point for the era of real-time radiation therapy and bringing, bringing these um, real-time into the mainstream rather than being something which is just the, the department of one of them, the more sort of expensive um, bespoke and not necessarily widely available tools that most of us have um, in our clinics. 
and, and really the goal we're trying to take that the concept of real-time image guidance that has been pioneered by a number of systems and bring them into the tools, use those on the, the tools that most of us have for the, the workhorses of cancer treatment are the, the Linux. And there are a lot of tools that we have to find the target. Um, we've got our KV images, our MV images. Um, often there's a, there's a respiratory monitoring system. And we've also got tools to, to hit the target and adjust the, adjust the alignment of the beam with the patient, either by the um, ultraleaf collimator or the couch. Um, there are 2D IGRT tools available that have been implemented in both research mode and also in um, as a clinical product. And I think it's just really good to see imaging, any, any imaging during treatment, I think is an advance to not seeing, to not seeing things. So if there is a large motion as, as seen in some of our prostate cancer cases, you can detect and correct. So 2D is, is good, it's real time, getting information, you can use it for, uh, you can use it for gating, but there's a lot of things that you wouldn't be able to, you're limited with just 2D information. Um, obviously you're not getting 3D or um, rotation. It's not a streamlined workflow. Um, you would not do uh, MLC tracking or couch tracking on 2D information alone and also the ability to then understand the dose to live it. So it's good to see progress to 2D, but going to 3D, I think is um, obvious. So the, the, the question then, can we locate targets with submillimeter accuracy in real time on every Linux? Um, and so if we take the innovation we did, take the patient treatment, uh, detect the positions of the of the markers in, in 2D, um, do a 2D to 3D reconstruction, and then implement that, um, implement that into software and also estimating the, uh, calculating the rotation. And so what we, what we have, the, the clinical tool that we've developed, um, killer voltage and refraction monitoring uh, is, is shown here, where we have the images being streamed um, in, in real time during treatment. Uh, and we can see the positions of markers in 2D. And uh, from that, we're getting the 3D of uh, the 3D information and with, with guidance to the treatment uh, to the treatment team as to whether to uh, continue um, or pause or pause the treatment. So this, um, this tool has been uh, implemented in uh, a number of clinical trials for the, uh, for the prostate. I'm not sure I showed one example. Uh, another example of where there was um, higher bladder dose, had we not, where there was a, a posterior shift during treatment um, is shown uh, at the top. For, for the prostate, only about one in six, um, we're seeing about one in six fractions would benefit from real time, uh, real time image guidance. Um, so comparing the, uh, in, in this, this trial, this was a 48, uh, a 48 patient trial of five fraction um, hyperfractionated prostate cancer radiation therapy. So comparing with, uh, with King, the real time image guidance compared to no real time tracking and looking at the, the dose deficit to the, uh, to the PTV. So we're seeing more than 5% uh, dose discrepancies in about one in six, uh, one in six of the fractions. Uh, similarly with the uh, with the rectum, that what we we're getting more consistent uh, daily dose when we're doing real time image guidance, and we're not seeing the few the occasional um, high high doses or or even the uh, the lower doses um, as well. This was a single arm trial, um, so this was not powered to detect clinical outcomes, but of course we did want to. Um, measure the clinical outcomes in case there was any uh, significant findings. And we did not see uh, EPIC as a patient recorded, patient reported quality of life um, study. And we did not see any reduction in the, um, in the quality, patient quality of life. And we also saw a reduction in the PSA as we would expect from any, any radiation therapy. 
the clinical trial results also showed that there was low, um, the toxicity for these patients was, was low and very acceptable. Um, we have, uh, so that was for the prostate, which moves um, small, uh, slow and small. And uh, we're currently running a study on uh, liver cancer, which, is, um, which has got much larger motion and faster motion although we're treating some of the patients in breath hold as well as uh, as well as free breathing and looking at whether this this uh, real-time image guided solution can be deployed to other um, other cancer sites but so the next uh, thing i want to talk about is the um, four-dimensional cone beam ct and the innovation here is just using the patient's breathing to drive 4D image acquisition. Uh, for, those, for those doing um, 4D cone beam CT, then it, it's very much where the, even though we're imaging to account for breathing, the images do not, uh, the, the respiration is not used during the acquisition itself. And so even though we're imaging for breathing, we're not using breathing to image. And that's the, the change that we're enacting. Um, also looking at uh, throughput, currently 40 cone beam CT takes uh, four minutes um, on the, cl the clinical systems. So it's quite slow with a high imaging dose, which challenges throughput. So we've got quite slow with a uh, high imaging dose. Um, so, and the image quality does vary with, with patients breathing and we've got quite high imaging dose. So we did um, look at, at and adapt, adapting the imaging to the patient. So using the patient's breathing signal to change, uh, to change the imaging. And so the, based on the, the breathing, uh, this is what we did uh, before, the, before the patients were there. So we've got a, a phantom that is breathing irregularly and that's driving the gantry rotation. We can see that the, the two arrows, that there's a variable gantry based on, the, based on the variable breathing. And also we are controlling when we acquire the images as well. So a fairly simple um, innovation. We're just letting the patient's breathing drive the image acquisition. Um, and also looking at motion compensated reconstruction and yielding patient images uh, such as that shown uh, at, the, at the bottom. The thing what we can do is get these images in a quarter of the scan time with 85% um, less, less dose. Uh, so we're, we are very excited about this um, technology simply because of the, the magnitude of the benefit, both in terms of throughput and the timing of the uh, and then the amount of dose that we're uh, that we're getting, and also uh, observing better image quality as well. So that's been um, just one of the innovations. And again, we're not all we're using is a fairly um, off-the-shelf respiratory sensor. is is the real only um, addition to a standard workflow. Um, so yeah, the, the main benefits to this innovation improved throughput, less patient discomfort, and more free, that, that does allow more frequent 40 imaging if we've got the lower dose. And the clinical applications, particularly for the improved image quality, are for central tumors, and we're also interested in cardiac motion management as well. We can potentially get further scan time reductions, but I won't uh, discuss that here. Okay, so. I did say that um, the title was uh, something radically different. So the uh, last thing I'll talk about is the NanoX project. Um, what is NanoX? And this is rotating a 70 kilogram patient, uh, not a 3.5 ton gantry. And interestingly, there have been a couple of approaches um, recently looking at upright, um, upright rotation. The, uh, the PQ and uh, Leo are looking at upright rotation systems, um, we chose to the smallest to do the smallest footprint, which is the horizontal uh, rotation and a 
um, artist's impression of what that could look like uh, is shown uh, is shown here. And really what we'd be looking at is um, the NanoX, a, a low cost compact, compact treatment system to improve global access to radiotherapy. So just a, a comparison that the technology um, is the same with a treatment beam and instead of rotating the gantry, we would rotate the patient. We, we have made a prototype um, of the system, which um, does not look as fancy as, uh, as the artist's impression, but to enable us to do the, have the same functionality of a, um, a fixed beam and a patient rotation system so that we could look at the, all of the different workflow aspects and, and risks that we would have to, um, have to resolve before making a, making a viable um, NanoX system. So the, the benefits, there's no heavy gantry, um, fewer moving parts, uh, much smaller footprint and less, less shielding. And if we take a look at the footprint and shielding, then a system could have, because there's no primary, um, the, the floor, assuming the floor is the primary shield, then you need um, much less, uh, much less concrete. And you could also, if you've got a fixed system, then you have increased weight to reduce leakage. And if you take that into account, then you're looking at a, um, a footprint of about one third of the conventional bunker with about one third of the concrete required. So in addition to a more compact system, you've got a more compact uh, treatment center. Uh, and there are, uh, as I mentioned, there are a couple of um, other um, upright, upright treatment approaches and also looking at robotic uh, patient positioning. So there, there are different ways to solve uh, to solve this problem. Uh, probably the, the hardest one um, is rotating the patient, but with potentially the smallest footprint. Um, so for our prototype, uh, the hardware arrived in um, January, uh, January 2017 at this, um, the, you know, in our research bunker um, came in the, in the box. We, of course, uh, the first thing you do when equipment arrives is you have a party. And this is uh, an example of the, the prototype uh, that we have with um, one of the, the team leads, Paul Liu, on this. So we've got translational control of the system uh, to, move the, uh, to move the patient um, into the beam. And we've also got uh, rotational control of the rotation as well of this, um, of this device. So I'll just bring that around so you can check that he hasn't fallen off. So as you can see, there's probably a few challenges um, that you might be thinking of in rotating, uh, rotating patients. One of them, of course, is just the, uh, the, the patient, patient comfort. Um, and another is the, if the patient the gravitational rotation, the, the force of gravity deforming the patient as they uh, as, as they rotate. So these are uh, with these. If we look at problems with um, motion and radiotherapy, like standard problems that we deal with, there's organ motion between imaging and treatment, and between treatments, uh, there's patient movement during treatment, and organ movement during treatment. So these are common problems for standard and for the, the NanoX system. Though the additional problems we need to solve is, is the patient movement during rotation, that they, there's some sliding at certain angles and organ movement due, due to rotation, uh, some deformation from gravity. So it's these additional, uh, the, these additional problems that we've been focusing our research efforts on solving and, and understanding. So the two questions, can we rotate patients comfortably and safely? And can we adapt to anatomic deformation during rotation? Uh, so we've, we've also um, got a, a similar system for um, MRI, uh, MRI imaging and looked at both comparing uh, zero degrees and 180 degrees. And we'll, 
what is the magnitude of deformation when we do rotate uh, rotate patients? Because this is the, the the magnitude of deformation is something that we need to be able to image and correct for if we're going to give equivalent treatment. Um, some of the qualitative patient response to rotate um, to rotation that we've had from our patients. I'm surprising that. You know, the first thing um, you look at or well, you ask people, particularly uh, doctors, you know, you can't rotate patients, um, but you actually, you find you can and, you know, patients, patients accept this. Um, the qualitative, uh, quantitative response when we're looking at the, um, we looked at scores of anxiety, uh, motion sickness and claustrophobia, and we did not see uh, any any major anxiety. The, um, there's more patients more anxious before they start than, uh, that, than after the, the treatment. And so the, the anxiety does, uh, does reduce. And I think that that's uh, you know, from personal experience of, of being in that, that device, that you are anxious the first time you rotate, and then you realize that you're safe. And after that, you're, you're fine. Um, yes, we, so we didn't see any quantitative difference um, before and after rotation and, and no correlation with claustrophobia as well. So then if, if patients accept rotation, the next question, can we image in the presence of gravitational um, reconstruction? Uh, we haven't done any humans as, as yet, uh, but we have, done, we have done rabbits. And what we were looking at is rotating uh, rotating the rabbits in this um, rotation stage and we're taking the um, fluoroscopic images as the rabbit rotated. So we needed to come up with a new reconstruction algorithm um, because, because of the deformation during gravity and the deformation that's correlated with the variable angles. So from the fixed gantry uh, using initially digital tomosynthesis to estimate that the motion fields and then using motion, motion compensated reconstruction and uh, projection shift, then we can come up with the, uh, with the reconstructed images at, at each angle. And so that was for, for rabbits where the deformation is, is smaller um, and an example of uh, conventional cone beam, the if we had not corrected, then we are seeing a lot of blurring due to that gravitational deformation. And when we correct for this motion, then we're actually getting reasonable quality, uh, reasonable quality images. So that was, uh, was, was rabbits. We need to get something um, bigger. So uh, what's bigger than a rabbit? We found a, a turkey. And so that was the next thing that we, uh, that we imaged. And uh, again, the um, uncorrected, Sorry, the unrotated uh, cone beam of a turkey, and then the rotated, the rotated image. So we've got more. Um, just the cone beam, we can again see that there are some challenges. So we applied uh, the smear algorithm to this, uh, some simultaneous motion estimation and image reconstruction. So that we're we've got two problems: we don't know what the motion is, and we don't know what the image looks like. So we're essentially solving. Uh, solving these iteratively one at a time, estimate the motion, use the motion to estimate the image, use the image to then uh, estimate, estimate the motion. Um, and so with that, um, with those images, then we found the, um, the, the smear cone beam CT, um, a long way from the reference CT, but for a cone beam CT, not terrible. Um, so these were these were rabbits. Uh, so that was um, we did rabbits and turkeys. Of course, the um, the animal of most interest for cancer radiotherapy are humans, and uh, we, we now have approval to do the human trial of this device and to get the images and just see can can we reconstruct um, these images on humans. And to, during radiotherapy, we are taking the conventional cone beam scan. I uh, will take additional nano X cone beam scan and do the visual comparisons um, by the experts. 
and also just um, standard image quality metrics as well. So we, we are excited about this um, technology moving forward. So just to uh, summarize the cost-effective globally deployable innovation radiotherapy, I think that there is strong clinical drivers for improvements in technology, improving outcomes. Uh, it can enable better radiation therapy, um, smarter and faster imaging and treatment. I think there's a lot of a lot of benefit, of course, in improving the workflow. I think that there's tremendous potential. Like there's there's so many different ways we can use the technology that we that we have available in in, in centres around the world to do things to do things better. Um, I showed three examples of just using essentially using physics and mathematics principles to uh, improve improve um, aspects of radiation therapy. And I think that there, there's many more that can be done. And I think it's just a really um, interesting space. Uh, so with that, I think I am uh, on time. And thank you for your um, participation and attendance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do not uh, see questions yet. At, uh, the chat uh, panel. Yeah, I just I just saw the congratulation to Paul that he's staying already on on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what I I have a one question. Did you did you I mean when you when you're rotating the people I mean uh, what is the uh, speed? Is it a three degree per second? Is kind of tolerable? Do you see a, a seasickness or? Yeah, um, no, I mean, we, we haven't, so we did, uh, we did rotate at um, three different, three different speeds. And the, even, um, I mean, even one rotation per second is, is sort of quite, it's not that fast. Like if you, you know, when you roll over in bed, that's like, you know, half a second, a, a, a second. So you know, we're looking at even say even 30 degrees a second, you don't really know. I mean, that's sort of like, you know, this is 30 degrees, yeah, it's probably, yeah, that's probably faster than 30 degrees a second. So it's not that, it's, yeah, it's not that fast. Like we would not see a dependence on rotation. Um, and it, it's quite interesting, some of the early work of um, astronaut, when they were doing this with astronaut training and they were rotating them, you know, ridiculously, fast and getting them spinning them around and getting them to do like you know mathematical <laughs> mathematics problems while they're in these really stressed stressed environments um but yeah so it's it's much less um much less challenging than that you're all you're all welcome uh, when you come when COVID allows you to come to australia then we can take put you on these devices and uh, spin you around <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I know that, you know, in a car, in a car crash uh, uh, industry, they sometimes have these, you know, that you experience when the car goes over, you put the belts in and then, you know, they, they, they take you over and then you feel, but it's, it's, it's quite frightening, but to be honest, but I see that you have a lot of uh, in, inflammable things around. So that probably holds uh, the person very tight. So he doesn't, you know, shake too much in, uh, in, in, in this, right? Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah, so a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it, patient comfort, but also like immobilization. Um, and yeah, that, that's important. Yeah. So there is another question. How do you envision this technology working in radiotherapy centers in uh, low and middle income countries that are, uh, that are trying to catch up in terms of education and some replacing their COBOL 60 with conventional Linux? So is that technology will be very difficult or? Yeah, so I think that's that's a excellent question, and I think when when people are buying conventional Linux now, it seems that they're that they are buying keeping the X, they've got coming with generally coming with X ray imaging, and that there's that there is a big a big step up in the clinical the, the education needed and the clinical workflow. I think a lot of what these um, in innovations are, it's also just adding automation. And think that the more we can automate procedures, then they can be faster. 
and also with less reliance on expertise or interpretation you know workforce it's not just technology that is a that is a um a challenge as um as I'm, I'm sure you're aware in low and middle income countries but there's just the you know the number of staff and the training of staff so the, the, there's many challenges but i think automation is a way that can overcome some of those some of those challenges both in terms of cost and and workforce it seems that from your uh, presentation paul a big impact can be achieved by improved uh, daily imaging even with simple in simple terms i mean you know technology which is much more readily mm. available before we implement but uh, in relation to that i mean it occurs to me that um, rotating the patient around the vertical axis may be less complicated than an horizontal axis can you comment on that yeah, yeah sure and what we did um we, that that's a, a common question but we have looked at both uh, upright um, upright imaging and, and upright rotation versus horizontal um, horizontal rotation and from the from the bunker size perspective like a, a vertical beam has got the lowest shielding um, has got the lowest shielding requirement but th there are additional challenges because just rotating a patient there's the time the time you need to get into the device you know in and out of the device and i think that that the um commercial approaches are upright is probably um an answer to that to that question good answer to that question about what people you know what, what people actually would would prefer but because we're a university we can uh, we can build these things and investigate them Okay, thank you. There is one more question. Uh, do you foresee this technology only in low-income countries, or also the high-income countries might might take it up? <laughs> um, that's an, uh, one of the things uh, that sort of learning in, in the, the business world that um, and low-middle-income countries people don't want. You know, here's the developed countries giving saying giving solutions, you know, here's what you, here's what you need. It's different, it's different technology to what the first world had, what has, but it suits you. And that that's not what people, you know, that, that, that's not what is um, accepted. So essentially the, the road to the, the road to low middle income, income countries is through, you know, is through New York, is through Texas, is through these high, you know, high end countries and demonstrate that the technology works safely effectively in high income countries and it's cost effective i think is sort of the, the way so so no i don't think i don't see these technologies just as solutions in low middle income countries thank you there is another another question uh since uh, since the nano x is, is, is so compact and requires uh you know less shielding and a small footprint do you see these as a mobile radiotherapy unit uh, basically going, you know, uh, to the remote locations or from one place to another. Mm, that, that is a good, um, that we, we have thought about that. There, there are challenges of, of course, challenges of mobile, mobile systems. And interestingly, the, uh, I mean, because of multiple, we have fractionation of, um, fractionation and radiation therapy. And that, that becomes, if it was a single, a single treatment, then that would make it viable. But particularly for advanced cancers, which is often, you know, there, there's often more advanced cancers in low middle income countries, then it, it makes it very difficult to, you know, even sort of one, one per week, like that, let's say you had five, five areas you were servicing, you know, one per week, it just, it could work, but logistically it would be a, it would be a challenge. But maybe this is, could be as a, as a backup unit, you know, if you have one unit installed and if it breaks down or something, you can just mm. bring it for a, for a week. Just true. Or... Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I, I do think it is, it is a viable option if we can make these systems smaller. And that, that's the other, like if we can make them smaller and cheaper. I mean, there's, let's say in, in Australia, and I think um, we have a lot of regional regional areas we're a very large country with a small population there's a lot of regional areas you can give chemotherapy in a regional area because it's because it's cheap 
Um, and if you can make radiotherapy cheap, then you can also offer radiotherapy in those in those areas as well. So it just sort of makes you don't just have radiotherapy in the big cities. You start to have them in the smaller towns, and then the even smaller towns. Like you can, you know, if you can deliver chemotherapy, there's a small cost to bring that up. If you can bring the cost of delivering radiotherapy down, then it can be more distributed. Exactly. So, and there is one comment, more or less. It's um, it's uh, how do you see? I mean, the the technology companies would make it cheap, uh, you know, because there is only du dupoli at the moment. I mean, it's it's probably related to the the the, the two big uh, Linux vendors. Mm. But um, yeah. So you know, so who would take this? Um, you know, who would take this to to market? It's probably not. Um, you know, the the duopoly have got have got solutions uh, they've got solutions in low um, in their low middle income and high, and high income countries so it's probably going to be either a if it, if it does happen either a well-funded um, you know well-funded new company or a company that is um, looking to get into um, looking to get into the market there are, you know let's say um, you know, Samsung has got into you know, radiology in a, in a big way, for example, a company like that, that could say, okay, well, you know, let's get into radiotherapy. How are we going to do it? Where, where is the market? Um, let's, let's do something, you know, really different. We'll see. Which I think, Time will tell. Yeah. yeah, which I think would be quite, quite good. I mean, the more, the more vendors we have as a users, you know, oh, uh, with more pressure. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I think it would be a, a, absolutely competition the more competition we have, then the more we'll see technology advancing. I mean, so it's some of the technology that we have has been quite, technology has progressed rather slowly in radiation therapy. And I think it is, again, looking at the radiology, it is quite different because you've got four vendors fighting neck and neck for, you know, for market share. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a sort of this relentless push to get better and better and better. Yeah, so I, I agree. The more competition we have, then the better it is for for the users, uh, for the products, and for prices. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. So, Sarah, yep, back to thank you. you very much. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Professor Kiel. Uh, special after uh, a bit late uh, hour in uh, Sydney for joining us. Uh, it's really appreciated. Um, thank you to the AAPM um, headquarters. Uh, of course, thank you for the text to the Medical Physics for All Benefits 